Square Ball Podcast. Welcome to the show. Dan here from the Square Ball. Phil Hay from The Athletic as we do our early week catch-up. Uh, it's brought to you with West Yorkshire Electrical as this show. Uh, specialists in all things electrical. If it's got wires in it, they will work with it. Um, and they sponsored the Revi, Wilco and Bielsa mural in Geisley, which you've read about the murals, haven't you? You're a big fan of that one. I did. I went up to that one. I went around all of them. I did the, the mural tour um, a little while ago because the Sports Trust have had that set up for quite a while, a, a nice map where you can follow them around. And it is a cracking mural, that one. It's really nicely done. It is a good one. Um, West Yorkshire Electrical, big Leeds fans, fully accredited, massive range of services for your home and your business, including uh, because they specialise in renewable technologies. You've got solar panel installation for home and business. There's an percent VAT government offer, I believe, on at the moment at the time of recording. Uh, battery storage, which hooks up to your, to your solar panels. Electrical vehicle charging as well. Um, and loads of other stuff. CCTV, LED lighting for, for your business. I mean, you'll need some lights in your new kitchen fit out, Phil. How is that going? Hasn't started yet. Three weeks to go. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd hope there'll be some lights in it for the for the money that's getting paid. Yes. Yeah, well, if there are no lights in it and you find yourself <laughs> like, oh, we've forgotten something in the dark and the money's run out, finance available for work on your home or your business, covering the whole of Yorkshire and beyond West Yorkshire Electrical. wyelectrical.co.uk for details or search West Yorkshire Electrical on your socials. Um, great week in the uh, in the world of Leeds United, wasn't it, this one? And I, I never got my 20-minute message, by the way. You promised me on the show before the weekend that you would message me on bang on 20 minutes, 3.35pm um, on Saturday, Phil. Where was my 20-minute message? With I, put yes. a wink, I wasn't being aggressive. I put a winky face. No, no, no. It wasn't like passive-aggressive, um, hello. But the, the point of that was that we said and we reckoned that we would know after about 20 minutes where... Um, the game was going to go, how it was shaping up. Um, what did I say? Uh, you said, and I quote, this is Chef Wed all over again, except Leeds will find a way through this time. And, and uh, Yeah, and I went, and, and I agreed, uh, we're miles better than just about everyone in this division. And though it came to pass, yeah. um, which it felt like it was going to, I think the Sheffield Wednesday game it seemed to, and particularly in the second half, it just seemed to get stuck in a cycle of not really going anywhere and and neither side really having the, the wit to make it happen. Um, you felt after half time against Wednesday that the best of Leeds chances had probably gone and, and might not come again. But it just didn't feel like that against Watford. I mean, they were they were so ridiculously dominant dominant against Watford that we were having a laugh at the the XG at half time, which I know not everybody believes in. Um, but it was standing at zero point zero one for Watford, and whether you believe in XG or not, that tells you that they were absolutely nowhere near Ilan Melier. Um, and they, at half time, they they had a, a shot on target registered, and we were all sitting amongst ourselves saying, "What was that? Like what?" And somebody said eventually, "Oh, that was the attempt of the lob from about forty five yards out that that almost hit the corner flag," and that was how it was. And I have to say, when when Ishmael came into the press conference afterwards, the first thing he said was, "Leeds totally deserved that today." You know, no argument with the result at all. We didn't play well enough. He thought that actually in the second half, they'd been structured slightly better um, than they had been before half time. But it didn't make any difference. And I I just had the feeling on Saturday that although the, it was kind of shaping up to be the Sheffield Wednesday game on repeat, I thought it would be different because it did feel as if Leeds were actually creating some really good chances, like the, the threat was constant and that they would get there in the end. Um, and everything about, I, I thought everybody played well um, on Saturday. I thought some players played exceptionally well Ruta seemed to move into cheat code territory, which we've all been waiting for him to do. It's not that we haven't seen little bits from him or, you know, good finishes so far this season, um, bits of good play. I, I think he's been impressive generally without necessarily being totally clinical. Um, but that was different level. And we've been talking, in, you and I and, and Michael, about how across the championship there is this really even standard and how there aren't that many players jumping out from your teams where the leads are playing against, where you think it'd be nice to have them in, in the squad. Ruta just looked on a completely different level um to, to everybody else. And and that, you know, that promises to be a big trick up up Farkas' sleeve. But Byron getting his goal, Piro scoring again, just leads, you know, being in control of that game all the, the way through. And there was a, a bit of a kind of book the open top bus feel at the end of the game, I thought. I was looking at the stands at how many people stayed behind afterwards. And it's not as if, you know, Ellen Road just empties straight away when, when a game finishes. But there are a hell of a lot of people who who did stay there. And I think that was because 
A, they, they appreciated the quality of the performance. And I do think it was a very, very high level performance, that one from Leeds. But I think they also appreciated the, the opportunity to have had a day that was fun and was enjoyable and that they warmed to football that they liked, football that they, they felt that they could believe in. Um, because it has been a while. Yeah, I was going to say, I um, I missed the Forest game. I was away for that one when we beat Forest in, well, whatever month it was. Um, prior to that, I think it would have been February. Southampton was the last home win that I saw. And before that, Bournemouth in November. So in the last year or something, I've seen two home wins at Ellen Road. It's It's been fairly um, fairly slim pickings, hasn't it? But, uh, I mean, you say that was a, a very high-level performance. Would you describe it as the most complete performance of the season? I'd say so, 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 so far. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I definitely would. And Farkas said that afterwards as well. See, I don't even think with the, the Forest and um, Southampton games, it's it, it's purely about how few home wins Leeds have had at, at Ellen Road. It, it's more about the ability to believe in something. And and it's great. When I, we decided to write about Byram over the weekend because it was a cracking header. It's a really good story, actually, Byram's. You know, from the, the starting point of him, this unknown kid playing in a pre-season friendly at, at Farsley, who, who Neil Warner didn't even really seem to, to know much about him or, or who he was, to breaking through and winning club's player of the year award um, in his first season, and then through the the injury problems he's had um, since you know he left Leeds and, and everything else, and coming back this summer and and having that moment, um, but I was writing about the the point where he left Leeds um, and when Leeds decided to sell him to West Ham, and and the crux of the problem was that his contract was running out. He'd been offered a new deal by Massimo Cellino, but at the time, Cellino was hell bent on cutting the wage bill down at Ellen Road. So the deal that was put forward to Byram amounted to a wage cut. You know, so you were you were saying to one of your most talented youngsters, most talented academy products, we'd like you to stay, but we'd like you to earn less money as a result. So needless to say, Byram decided to move on and, and was sold to to West Ham. But what it made me realize was that back then, and particularly because there's no bad blood with Byram, I think people seem to really understand that. He had his reasons, and those reasons were probably justified. You know that the the attempt to extend this deal was a bit of a shambles, and if anything, helped to push him out the door. It just wasn't a club back then, Leeds, that you could really believe in. You know, it wasn't a club that you could say to players, "This is the right place for you, and and good things are going to happen here," because there was nothing to suggest that 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 was actually going to be the case. You know, those were the days when, you know, one group of supporters were carrying a coffin round to the stand, you know, to kind of signify the the pending death of the club or, or the death of its its ethos. And, you know, th- there was just a lot of disillusionment. And I, I can totally understand if that was the case in the dressing room as well. And, and you know, we had that feeling with a lot of the football last season, but it was different on Saturday because that's a performance that made you think this is a, this is a genuinely, genuinely good team with a genuinely good coach and something good could be building here, really could be. And I think that's why the stands were so full afterwards because, Everybody just had that little buzz of thinking, this is this is really promising. I really understand what they mean when people say that there is a, a relegation hangover because it's kind of been weighing on Leeds across the summer, the anxiety attached to it, all the churn in the playing squad, and it went all the way to the end of the window, which obviously closed now. It's sort of three and a half weeks ago, isn't it? And it, I don't think it's any coincidence that now the window's closed and we know what we've got, that we're now starting to feel a little bit more settled and everybody's not quite as quite as antsy it seems to be that you you're finding a club and a team and players that are just kind of finding themselves almost again like everybody's sort of emerging from the darkness of relegation and seeing what is actually in front of us and what we're capable of Parker said that though didn't he he, he was saying through August I will actually be really happy when the, the transfer window closes and Leeds were in that weird position where the transfer window was driving them mad because it was causing them problems with what they had internally. You know, they had so many players who were trying to go, so many players that they couldn't stop leaving, some like Nonto who had no um, right or option to go, but was trying to, to force his way out anyway. But at the same time, they didn't have a strong enough squad. You know, I, I again, I was saying about the Byram signing, when he joined, rejoined the club, there's kind of this feeling of indifference about it. It wasn't as if it was kind of roundly criticised, but I think people... I think people were indifferent because the squad was so far from being strong enough at the time. There was so much else that needed to be done. And with Byram, you knew that at full tilt, he'd be a really good player, but he'd had a lot of injuries. He hadn't played a huge amount over the previous three years. And it did beg the question of, is this a a sensible move? And I think more to the point, 
that that feeling of well this on its own isn't going to make any difference to us actually it turns out that it might make a massive difference because he was looking like an incredibly competent left back but the point i'm making was that you still needed Piro, you still needed kamara who i thought had a terrific debut on Saturday you still needed you know the the additions to the squad that were going to make them strong enough to compete particularly um in attack and you know so yes the window needed to be open for long enough to Leeds to get that right but Farker equally needed the line to be drawn so that he could say this is what I've got this is what we're kind of moving forward with there's a bit of certainty and a bit of stability at last and you can't deny I don't think looking back now, that has helped massively to sort of purge the dressing room of people who didn't want to be there. I mean, you know, the the frustration over Sinistera, the way he left and everything else, you, you looking at Anthony so far, and, and particularly on Saturday and thinkable, it's not a bad like-for-like like swap. And actually, on, on two counts, this could be beneficial for Leeds. Firstly, that you know you you have a player who actually wants to be at the club as opposed to Sinistera who clearly wanted to go. But also, Anthony might be fit for more of the season than Sinistera. We'll, we'll see how that goes. He might actually be a, a more usable asset. But there is another aspect to this as well, which is that once you start winning games, the, the mood and the feeling around the place, particularly when you're winning like they did against Watford, the, the mood does change. You feel it when you go up to the training ground. You feel it when you speak to players and coaches coaches and, and everybody else. There is just that different buzz. And I was asking Fark after the game on Saturday, because he mentioned Pukki. Um, at Norwich um, briefly. And I sort of said to him, surely it helps the rest of the dressing room to have somebody like Piro there, who is a 20-goal striker and who you can actually count on to score you the goals. And yes, you know, great to have somebody like Ruter as well, who's doing, who's playing like he plays and is able to to do the tricks that he does and, and show the level of skill that he does. But even just, you know, at a basic level, having a striker that you know is going to put chances away must make a huge difference in the same way as that growing feeling that you're actually a really good team does help you. It definitely does. Pirro had a, um, an almost ordinary game up to a point, didn't he, of, of the scoring. I thought he just kind of, he was there, but didn't make a huge impression. And I came to realise over watching him over the duration of this game, this is what he's going to do. He's just going to be there. He's going to link up. He's going to be tidy. He'll just keep popping up with goals. Very good. And what you were talking about there, Phil, actually, players who... Um, who want to leave. We've signed up Gatano Baradi as a columnist for us in the in the magazine, in the fanzine, for this um for this season. And he's touched on this actually in his column. And he said, and I quote, if a player wants to leave Leeds United, then the best thing for the club is to let them go. You need to have players with the right mentality. But as a player, you have to respect the club that's paying you. Sometimes a player can have the right reasons for wanting to leave, but in many cases the players are just crying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was it was very much the Bielsa mantra of if you're going, you're going. You know, I, the the situation that always jumps out when I think about this is the one with Samu Sayers in Bielsa's first season. The Sayers was um, on his day was you know, had immense quality and could dictate games. Um, really, real sort of driving force in that advanced midfield position. But he was a little bit in and out as well, and you could tell from the fact that that he did drop to the bench eventually that he wasn't somebody that Bielsa necessarily felt he could count on religiously for for forty six games. But he was still a really big asset. But when it came to Sayers saying, "Look, I'm homesick and I want to go home," Bielsa instantly was just just said to the club, "Okay, we'll let him go, and then yeah. he can go to advance to the window. I don't want him here. You know, if, if that's how it is, he's gone." And we were all pretty shocked by that. We we're quite surprised, not because we didn't think that that's how Bielsa operated just because it seemed to be a decision taken in the blink of an eye. Um, but I think it's right. And I think you, there are some players who you can talk around and there are some players who can go from, I mean, Beckford being a good example, you know, that if you think the season when Leeds were promoted 09-10, him putting in a transfer request in, in January, but then being convinced to stay and actually, you know, scoring the goal that, that got Leeds promoted in the end. And okay, left on a free transfer after that, but, you know, did his bit and, and got the club out of the division, out of League One. There are circumstances where it, it doesn't need to be the end of the line. But I think in the majority of cases, when players are agitating to go, you don't have a lot of choice because they're not so much used to you if that's the, their attitude. And that was the one of, one of the big things with Ruter over the summer, that he wasn't one of the players who was asking to leave and he wasn't the player who was saying to Leeds, look, I don't see myself here anymore. Farker almost suggested a week or so ago that Ruta's attitude was, I've, been, I've cost £30 million, I've come to the Premier League, come to England, I've done nothing, I really do need to stick around and, until people can look at me and say, 
he's actually a really good footballer. And um, in a lot of ways, Saturday was the day. He was living his best life, wasn't he? It was a young man living his best life. I was so pleased for him because um, I, I was one of the, the people who stayed behind at the end. And he, uh, after speaking to Farker on the pitch, and I don't know if, the, if maybe this was a deliberate tactic on Farker's part to hold him back from the rest of the group, allowed everybody else to kind of go around. It meant that he got to do sort of his own little solo lap of the pitch and he was the last one round. But it, what it did mean is that everybody could sing his name and he absolutely laps it up. The smile on his face was... Um, was just beautiful. He was just encouraging the crowd, egging everybody on. Um, but I thought it was really well handled that by Farker as well. They were saying to him, don't take the piss too much, express yourself and all that. But you wonder if maybe he gave him that little opportunity to be um, to be signalled by the crowd for the crowd to appreciate him. Yeah, I think that'll be important for Ritter as well. There was a, a definite confidence issue there last season, which is hardly a surprise given the, the narrative around him and also the you know the kind of shambles that he was he was walking into. Um, you can't win, really, can you? On the one hand, you you know, four or five months ago, you've got people saying, "Why on earth have we paid money for this player?" And then, you know, four or five months later, um, you've got your manager saying to you, "Please don't take the piss out of you know solid Championship pros. They're good footballers and good guys." Um, <laughs> to be to be fair to Ruter, I don't really think he was doing that on Saturday. And actually, Farke did say, "I'm I'm not applying that to this game specifically. I'm just reminding him." You know that it, there's, there's got to be a, a certain level of appreciation of you know of, of what you're doing and, and of being seen to do the right things. I, I thought the little touches of brilliance from Ruta actually helped open the game up and and made a difference. And the crowd just absolutely loved that as well. Um, but this is this is what I mean. You know, when when players when players are made to feel like that, and when the atmosphere becomes so healthy that you you know you you are genuinely desperate to to play your next game, which I can't believe for a second was ever really the case last season, certainly not in the second half of it. It it helps massively. Um, and you were saying that, that Piro was kind of, you know, in the game, but but not so much there on Saturday. I started to think in the second half that the interchange of positions between him and Ruta made a, a really big difference. And there is going to be this debate, isn't there, about should Piro be at nine, should Ruta be at 10, should somebody else be at 10 so that Piro could, can play up front but I do feel like it's working I do feel like it, it is working and perhaps it isn't you know perhaps it isn't letting Leeds win games off the bat you know in 20-30 minutes before half time and, and it didn't on Saturday um, but in the end it was overwhelming Just returning to the themes that we were speaking about there Phil um, Byram played at left back Shackleton at right back was Byram our one to watch going into the weekend I feel like I got so giddy with the match and so caught up in it that I've forgotten I think he was, and even if he wasn't, let's just pretend he was, because it actually actually went well. Um, but he, one of the funny things about Byram is that all that's changed with him between leaving Leeds and coming back to Leeds is that he was a right back and he's now a left back, and and I think he he is actually quite a rare player in that he can genuinely play on both sides as opposed to you know this thing where you have a, a right back where you say yeah he could he could do a job at left back if he needed to, but actually he needs to be playing on the right-hand side. Um, Byram, to look at him, is just the Byram that I remember as a kid. Like he, 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 His body has obviously got older um, and has taken a lot of hammer, but his face hasn't aged at all. And like that grin on his on his face as he, he ran to the corner flag um, was just like going back five or six years, you know, to, to when he was scoring away at Forest, his last goal back in, in 2015 for Leeds. I thought as well that the the reaction to him scoring was quite telling because the, the, he was he was completely mobbed in the corner and I think the players at Leeds will realise that he's had a difficult time over the past three years. You know, it hasn't been easy for him and you know he he basically got himself a contract at Leeds by avoiding missing a single training session through pre season. You know, it was a good demonstration of his fitness and I think if there were Oh, and there absolutely were big question marks over whether it was a sensible signing or whether you know it was the right thing to do given his his track record. But I think that that demonstrated where he was at and and proved that he was worth um, having a go at. And and you know Farco obviously knew him really well, rated him, and and said to the club in the end, look, I don't think there'll be a better left back in the championship than Byram if he's fit and and if he plays. Um, so really really pleased for him actually because I remember him coming through he was, he was a, a lovely lad was Byram and he was a, a great player as well and and I just think he's got that fluent flowing style about him where he doesn't make much in the way of mistakes there's not a lot that ruffles him he, he likes to attack but him attacking doesn't really compromise him as a defender and he does score goals you know he does chip in goals from time to time and I think he probably will um, there's a cracking header as well 
It was a bloody good header, wasn't it? Yeah, he absolutely um, smashed that one. Thunder home. bastard. Thunder yeah. bastard. Yeah, I agree, I think. Absolutely. And a word, if we can, um, we'll come back to Jorginho Rute's, um contribution to, to Jaden Anthony's goal, which I thought was a, a nice yeah. little, it was the cherry on the icing, wasn't it, that one, um, in a minute or two. But a word for Dan James, if we can, because two assists for him, he's had a bit of a mixed time. You feel like he was almost messed around a little bit around the, the Fulham loan, and you know maybe we could have used him last year. Who knows? But what, whatever has played out, he seems to be just finding his groove a little bit now. Again, a, a lower division, which I think will help in the way that it has to help Ruta. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there have been confidence issues there also because, you know, it wasn't a great move to fill them. The way in which it was handled, I know that James wasn't particularly pleased about um, about the way that happened. But also even going back further than than that, you, you had him as this, almost like this fixation of Bielsa's, you know, this player that Bielsa loved, didn't quite get first time round, even though it was it was that close but then did get from Manchester United for a really, really big fee by Leeds standards at a time where it didn't really feel as if James was what they were after and what they really required. Looking at that squad at the start of the 21-22 season, yes, you know, because Bielsa rated him so highly, he kind of thought, well, it'd be fascinating to see what he does with James, but it didn't feel like that was the gap in the squad that desperately needed plugged right at the end. So, you know, it hasn't been a, a great spell for James. He, I also felt like at Manchester United, he became a bit of a lightning rod for the frustration about the Glazers and, and Solskjaer, which was was pretty unfair. Um, but that you know that doesn't doesn't build you up in in any way. But I think what he did on Saturday was what people quite often accuse him of not doing. Was yes, the running was there, the sprinting was there, the, the counter attacking, and, and the threat to defences on the basis that he's so quick, he's a he's a real handful. But the end product. As, uh, you know, was was there on top of it. And not for the first time either. You know, did the same at, at Millwall. I know he missed that chance at Millwall that, that looked, you know, easier to score than to miss. But straight after that, there was the ball to Ruta that let Ruta score. And what you're starting to see is that there really are options for Farker now. You know, if you're, if you're Ishmael and you're in the, the away dugout, and Farker is able to bring on Anthony, who does that right at the end of the game, you, you do feel like there's a manager to your right who has a stronger hand to play than you do. And more than one coach now has said, you know, this is going to be a good Leeds team. I think Rowett said it at Millwall. Um, Rosinha said the same um, about Farkas side after the, the draw at Hull. I think there are people out in the Championship now who very much think Leeds are in the conversation for for going up and, and I would think for potentially for finishing top two. Would be very nice, Phil. I would, I'd be happy with that. If we could do top two. I think that'd be a good return this season. I don't know about you. I, I think I think I predicted sixth, didn't I? When you, you forced me into making a prediction, um, and I'm starting to wonder if that was slightly conservative. Um, but it's 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 early still. It kind of feels oddly like we're already about twenty games into the season when, in fact, it's it's only eight. Um, but the, there is a hell of a long way to go, and I think we all remember what it's like when you get into the depths in November and December, and you've you've got to keep grinding. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at the um, at the table now, and we are sixth as it stands at the minute. That um, whole win at Stoke pushed them just above us in the table over the weekend. But um, yeah, played eight, won three, drawn four, lost one. So you could make a case for us winning seven out of those eight and being right up there with um, with Leicester and Ipswich at the minute, I would say. But um, didn't yeah. quite happen that way, did it? No, I don't disagree. Um, I don't disagree. Uh, they they could easily have lost the Cardiff game as it was, um, and but I, I still thought they were the better side despite how late the the goal came. Leicester's form is definitely looking ominous, and I I, I think. I think everybody probably expected Leicester to be pretty strong. I, I spoke to Robert Snodgrass for a piece that we did on Moreska after he was appointed by Leicester. And Snodgrass said, look, he, he'll be very good for them. He will. He'll, he'll, he, aside from the fact that he's got really, really good squad, really good players at Leicester, technically and tactically as a coach, he's, he, he is pretty, you know, pretty impressive, um, knows, knows his stuff. I'm a little surprised at how it's going for Southampton and it doesn't sound like all's well down there at all. I thought they were pretty well set and it is it is kind of fascinating to look back now and, and see the way in which there was annoyance, certainly in the in these parts, about the way in which Southampton seemed to have the ducks in a row much quicker than Leeds through the summer. And then to contrast that with how things are now, there seems to be some griping down there about Russell Martin's style of play, results aren't coming, beating at Middlesbrough at the weekend. Obviously, have Leeds at home next, which is really big game for, for them all of a sudden. Um, and, you know, Leicester, 
Leicester looking, you know, Leicester looking very, very good shape. And and I'd be a little surprised if they don't finish top two. But it does feel like Leeds are, are starting to roll. Yeah, and Leeds now seem to be, we seem to be growing like an inner confidence, like a self-assurance just seems to be growing. I think maybe that's what we're doing in terms of emerging from the shadow of relegation now. It feels like we know what our identity is again now. And uh, that's down to the job that Fark is doing. Just to, we'll get into that in a second. I was going to say just to close off a couple of thoughts. Um, you mentioned about Dan James end product before. I thought that ball to Pirro was excellent, particularly. Oh, beauty. Yeah, yeah, no, it was you, right on the button. If you watch Pirro signals twice where he wants it, edge of the area, and then when he's in there again, and bang, landed it um, right on the sixpence. And it's nice just to see him just t- just took it away. A player who's absolutely full of confidence as well. Um, just doing what he does though, and that's what you get with a forward like that. I wonder what the combined distance of his four goals so far is. But yeah, it would be interesting to look. I mean, he we, we spoke to him um, before the whole game and we were talking about the, the goal at Millwall and he, he was going through how he understood it with Dan James and saying that, you know, when James hit the ball, one way or the other, all that was going to happen was it was going to go towards the back post. You know, so in Pirro's head, he's thinking, even though James should finish this as this comes in, I'm going to put myself in that position because that inevitably is going to be where it is. So either James scores or if there's a ricochet like there is, I have the chance of, of putting it in. And I think the phrase he used was that sometimes you you know, you know you, you practice for this stuff, you train for this stuff, you, you kind of know what you should be doing, but sometimes you also just smell it, you know, as a striker. If you're a striker who scores goals, and you're right, you could see that in, in the process of that attack, of him saying, put it there, put it there. And knowing that if Dan James did put it there, he was going to finish. Um, just to go back to Farker as well, I think you know, an identity it has been really consistent so far, would be my observation. And I, I think that's a really good thing because I don't get the sense with Farker that this is going to swing to extremes. You know, I don't think you're going to have miserable days interspersed with fantastic wins um, that mean that there's a, a big kind of emotional burst one way or the other. I think he'll be very good at keeping this on the level right the way through the season. And I don't think you will have points where it gets wildly out of control. Um, He just seems to have the measure of this and and a lot of confidence in himself. I just think you're looking at a really good professional coach in Farker. I think it's it's transmitting to the fans as well. Even little things like, I mean, I know everybody kind of was on the feet, you know, with the ball control. Oh, it's brilliant. But but what that represents, you know, just and the little... I don't know, it was the kind of the little, if you look at the video of it, the little nod, the kind of, yeah, I know. Uh, it, it just, he, ex- he exudes confidence. Like he knows what he wants from this team. He knows where they're heading. And the fans, I think, are now starting to understand it and see it. Um, and I mentioned on the match ball as well, the little murmurings of discontent in the first half when we were kind of, we were in possession and in control, but not really making any inroads um, into the attack. So um, there was that kind of, you know, do something leads kind of sense just, yeah, just bubbling that, under that. Ellen Road. But now I think people now are learning and, and have seen that, you know, because these three goals came late and we and we really opened them up towards the end, that um, it may just take a little bit of patience sometimes. Yeah, because we, we did actually, we were chatting about that in the press box at the time, about the, the grumbling, and we were kind of saying it's not massively helpful, that. Um, and and you know why it's happening, and I think it's probably, you spoke about hangover, you know, from, from last season. It, it probably is that little bit of a hangover of the the frustration of when things aren't quite working as they should. Um, but it, it felt a little bit like the, the small sections of the crowd who were doing that going a little bit early, if you know what I mean. Um, because that game was was well under control. And yeah, Ruta had missed that early chance that he should have scored. And um, Bachman had a, a, had a, a right old game um, in goal for Watford. Um, but it it was it was good. I mean, the, the, the best bit of the of the Farker takedown apart from him looking like Ronaldinho, was the guy in the background of the video who picked the, the worst moment to stand up and go out, presumably go to the toilet. Um, but he'd literally just got up out of his seat and turned his back as Farker brought brought that down. And you're right, you know, the reaction, Farker's reaction was, was quite amusing, just that sort of cheeky look to the crowd. Of that that wasn't bad, was it? Um, but he's not, he, I don't think, he doesn't seem particularly fussed, Farker, with attention and limelight. I think deep down, and I think on a personal level, from what's been said and from what was said by him in in the interviews with Leeds as well. He wants to be a Premier League manager and I think he wants to be seen as a Premier League manager and and one who can live and cope at that level for for quite a good length of time. But I think he realises as well that you kind of have to earn it um, and that 
you know, as much as a coach is absolutely critical, it is the players and it's the performances that are going to do it for you. Um, and he's almost quite good at being assertive and forthright while being in the background at the same time. It's it's quite a clever mix. Um, speaking of the Premier League, I mean, you can't help but watch what happened to Sheffield United yesterday and almost be thankful we're not there, Ouch. struggling on for another season, you know, trying to, to make this thing work. And, I, and I'm increasingly of the opinion that as much as it hurt to go down last year and it hurt to have all the uh, the rats desert in the sinking ship, uh, it might have been for the best, you know, just to clear the decks and, and start again. And also have a bit of fun again. Um, it's It can't be a coincidence that the Premier League table has your, your three promoted clubs on one point and in the bottom three at the moment. I mean, that was an, that was an absolute pasting for Sheffield United yesterday. Um, and, you know, the, the kind of... The cynic in you or the, the common sense in you says that Heckenbottom probably won't survive very long from here. You know, that that's and and that seems really harsh to me. Um, because it is incredibly difficult to get into that league and and just start mixing it. And perhaps, you know, it's perhaps it's slightly skewed this season on the basis that you know, Luton, Burnley, Sheffield United were not going to be going up with huge budgets or massive amounts of cash behind them. And perhaps if it was Leeds who were promoted with the 49ers in place as as the ownership group. There would be more money um, and and more scope to to compete a little bit better, um, but it's you know the, the, there is a massive gap between Newcastle and Sheffield United on on a number of levels, and it is leagues within leagues um, in the Premier League, and it makes it very difficult to know what it is that you you're supposed to be aiming for. Well, whereas you come back into the Championship and it does become about the playoffs and promotion and the title and and everything else and. It's just a bit of a clearer picture, a bit of a clearer picture, I think a bit easier to to engage in. Um, and yeah, lo and behold, you, you get relegated and it's more fun than it was when you were in the Premier League, certainly in certain parts of it. It's the great paradox, isn't it? It's the great paradox. Mm-hmm. Is that It's what Moscow said on our shows before. He'd quite happily win it every year and never go up if we could do that. But uh, <laughs> it would say it'd soon lead to financial implosion, wouldn't it? And a, and a great reset, but it's a nice idea. But uh, can I just ask you about one issue that um, was brought to my attention? I was tweeted yesterday, somebody saying, can you ask Phil about this? Helder Costa, still here, hasn't gone yet. Um, nope. Saudi window is now closed. Do you expect maybe there to be a contract termination in the pipeline then to free him up? We, we'll see what happens. Uh, the, the expectation was that he would go. I mean, as Farker said himself, Costa had said that he wanted to leave, hence why he wasn't involved at all over the summer. And there's simply no way he can be reintegrated now. You know, he hasn't trained through pre-season. He, he isn't familiar with what Farker's doing. He's been training, training on his own. Um, I mean, there was obviously the, the Turkish window as well, which would have been an option. I think we all expected that he probably would go back to Saudi, but nothing has developed there. Um, yeah, I mean, one of a handful of things is going to have to happen here. Either they terminate his contract or when they get around to January, they find somewhere for him to go for, for six months um, so that he can um, he can just kind of bun down what's left of his deal and then move on. Or he just sits tight um, to the end of the season and, and moves on as a free agent when his contract runs out. Strange one, Costa, really, because he's been so anonymous for so long that you almost feel like it's been a waste of money and a waste of a signing. But he was, you know, relatively influential to a point um, in the Bielsa season when they were promoted. And he was kind of, you know, heavily involved in in what went on that year. But I suppose given that Leeds went up and then came down and, and Costa looks like he will most likely move on for, for a free transfer at some point, it's not particularly one that's worked. All in all then, Phil, uh, a good week in the life of Leeds as we started the show um, saying that. And isn't it funny contrasting, like I remember like last season, we'd get out of a weekend and I was thinking, thank God I don't have to bother with this again for another week and we don't have midweek fixtures. Whereas now we're off the back of seven points in a week, scoring for fun. Um, in a couple of those games. And I'm like, oh, it's Saturday. I've got to wait till Saturday now for the next game. Come on, can't we have a midweek one? Yeah, two podcasts a week last season was was pretty hard going um, because he seemed to be going around in circles, didn't he? It was the same stuff over and over again and, and nothing seemed to change enough. And it was like creeping death that was it was coming down, down the track. Um, seven points from this week just gone is really good. A really good set of results and I'd say again as I was chatting about on the previous podcast have a look at what happened at Norwich in Farker's first season at this point this was when it really really clicked um, and and the results really started to come and I mean it's I, again if it's going to be top two this season that's going to have to happen because you've 
we've already got a couple of sides who've made really good inroads um, and, and you can't ever allow the gap to become too big. But I think in terms of the top six, Leeds have positioned themselves after eight games exactly where they, they want to be, you know, right in the mix. Nice one, Phil. Um, if you want to catch up with the Gitano Berardi column that's in the latest magazine, that's issue two of the mag, you can uh, buy that at Ellen Road at the home games and it's available at the squareball.net as well. Have a look around on there. Uh, we'll get back together, me, you and Michael, towards the end of the week, preview Southampton. And um, we'll speak then, Phil, yeah? Thank you. The Squareball Podcast. 